Thanks a lot, uh, Timo, and for the organizers for inviting me to this really nice uh, workshop. Animals interact with the world via their moving bodies. This is true for single cell organisms, like cilia, uh, to humans. And how these self-generated movements are incorporated in neural processing has been uh, an interest in systems neuroscience uh, for a long time. For example, in mice it has, uh, about 10 years ago, a bit over that, has been shown that locomotion actually uh, substantially enhances responses in the visual, air, uh, visual cortex. Moreover, recently, spontaneous movements have received substantial attention also because of uh, additional observations made in mice. So here are two papers uh, published in 2019 that showed a dramatic effect of spontaneous task unrelated movements on neural activity brain-wide, which has uh, further increased interest in this question. And one study, uh, uh, this uh, by Musal uh, uh, Kaufman and colleagues from Anne Schottland's lab, uh, showed that in head-fixed mice that were not allowed to locomote and performed uh, perceptual decision tasks, spontaneous movements modulated neural activity across uh, the whole brain, including in the primary visual cortex. And this p pattern persisted even at the level of individual trials where surprisingly neural variability explained by spontaneous task unrelated movements was greater than due to uh, task dependent covariates, also including in the visual cortex. Moreover, it has been uh, previously been hypothesized that the modulation by spatial attention that is observed op uh, um, typically in uh, primates is related to the modulation by movements seen in other species. So, so far, my lab has not really worked on the prefrontal cortex, and I was initially a little bit surprised when I received the invitation uh, to speak here. And so most of the data that I'll be talking about will come from the visual cortex, but I believe that our results can serve as a useful example um, to emphasize the value of these direct cross-species comparisons, even for very basic uh, response mechanisms. So the gap I'm picking up today is that we know what attention does in primates, but we don't really know what these spontaneous movements do. And if this is fundamental across species, then obviously we should observe this um, also in primates. So the first question I'll be uh, asking is, do spontaneous movement, uh, body movements in primates modulate neural activity? <clears throat> and secondly, whether the modulation by attention and movement are linked, as has been hypothesized. And finally, I'll end uh, with some uh, more general considerations uh, on such uh, cross-species comparisons. Before I start, I should really acknowledge uh, the uh, uh, people who did this work. This was a real team effort, and I'd particularly like to highlight the two people on the, uh, on the left, Bharat Thuluri and Inchil Kang, who led uh, uh, this effort and um, they, who are two postdocs in the lab, and um, this was done in collaboration with uh, Dan Butts and uh, Jake Yates. So we used two types of visual tasks uh, in macaque monkeys, and um, they were both tasks where the monkeys were asked to uh, fixate and then uh, perform uh, different visual types of tasks. And uh, in addition to a relatively standard uh, setup where we recorded in visual areas V1, V2, V3, V3A, we also added two uh, video cameras uh, to monitor the movements of the uh, body uh, and uh, of the face. So one camera uh, pointing towards the body and one to the, towards the face. The monkeys were head fixed sitting in a primate chair, but even so, when also while they are performing a task, um, they, there are substantial movements uh, that they do, like scratching themselves and repositioning. So th these uh, monkeys move a lot, and it's therefore plausible that these spontaneous body movements that are completely task unrelated might influence activity, including in visual areas. Now, to quantify these movements, we performed uh, singular value decomposition, as was done in uh, one of these uh, previous um, mouse studies, and so um, basically this um, is a, a 
very similar to PCA, uh, that gives us different components that actually relate to plausible features of, uh, in this case, for instance, of the face. So this was done on the pixel-wise uh, difference between two consecutive frames on which uh, we did this uh, type of um, decomposition. And uh, then we back projected uh, the movement back onto these components, and that's what these blue traces are. And uh, so these are um, time courses of these uh, individual movement components. And what this looks like uh, can be seen here. <clears throat> and as uh, you see in the left, um, for instance, the uh, top component, you can see this re is really um, monitoring um, movements around the eye, and you can see as the monkey is blinking or moving its eyes, you, uh, there are these wiggles. And similar for the uh, body movement, the monkey is scratching, you has, uh, has these um, uh, wiggles in the traces. So this is how uh, uh, we captured uh, these movements, and then we relate them to the activity in uh, these different areas that we recorded from. And to do so, we used uh, uh, a multivariate uh, regression model that was analogous to the approach used by uh, the work from Musal and colleagues uh, and adapted after their approach. So we had a set of regressors uh, shown here. These are task, uh, trial events. And we also had the projection of the movie uh, uh, onto the top 30 uh, components for both the face view and separately for the body view. And then we also included a drift regressor to capture slow fluctuations in firing rate. So note that this is on a different time scale. So these are very slow uh, fluctuations. And then we obtained beta weights for each of these regressors. And overall, the model did a really good job at capturing the average, trial averaged activity, the PSDHs. This is for three example units. And on the average, the model captured 97% um, of the variance of these PSTHs. But the power of using this modeling approach is that it really allows us to look at single trial variability, um, especially if they are not the same uh, on each trial, for instance, for the movements, uh, to then quantify the contribution uh, to these predictors, uh, to the overall neural variability. And so that's how we quantified the, da uh, find the data. So we computed the cross-validated variance explained by the model at the level of single trials. And that's what I'm showing here. And each, uh, for each unit, and they, they are sorted by the amount of variance explained uh, for, by the full model, as shown here in green. And if these movement components contribute to neural variability, then if we take them out, so if we take the video regressors out, uh, then we should observe a drop in the overall model performance. And that's exactly what we see here in this uh, orange uh, line, at least for a significant number of neurons. This is more clearly captured here, uh, down below in blue, where a substantial number of units seem to have some uh, variability that's uniquely captured by these movement components. So yeah, I'll refer to this as the unique variance, um, simply the uh, difference in these, uh, uh, two model, <coughs> in these two models. But there's actually a wrinkle to this story, and that is that we had uh, designed, we had a trial-based design where the monkeys were required to maintain fixation when, uh, uh, for, for us to show uh, the stimuli. And then in between these trials, the monkeys were allowed to uh, look wherever they wanted. And so during these uh, epochs when the stimulus was presented, we, uh, the, um, we had, the stimuli were, or we had retinal control um, well, in these other epochs, um, the visual input was not under experimental control. And the data, that the catches that the data I've just shown you was actually from those epochs where the retinal input was not under experimental control. Now, what does the uh, data look like if the, uh, if the visual input was under experimental control? For those epochs, the variance uniquely explained by this movement almost completely disappeared. This is clearly shown uh, here uh, qualitatively, but also uh, highly statistically uh, quantitatively. Okay, so we then we had different uh, views, one view uh, targeting the face, one targeting the trunk and the limbs. 
And so we could look at the contribution of these two views separately. And that's what we did next. For the face view, uh, the pattern is very similar to the one I've just shown you. Uh, for the epochs that are not under, uh, where the retinal input is not under experimental control, we have some variability to explain, uh, while for the uh, uh, other epochs, the variance explained is very close to zero. But when you look at the same um, thing for just the uh, body view, it's actually, there's hardly any variance to be explained in, uh, for either epochs. And actually this pattern that it's only uh, the face view that accounts for variability is uh, also mirroring the previous findings uh, in the mouse. And this pattern was uh, consistent across the different areas that we recorded from. So to summarize this, what we see is that it's only the face movements, but not the body movements, that contribute to neural variability in these visual areas. And it's only during epochs when the retinal input uh, was not under experimental control. So this raises an interesting possibility. Given that the cameras recording the face uh, movements also capture eye movements, it could be that it's uh, changes in the retinal input due to these eye movements that actually explain the observed modulation. To test this, we uh, took our measurements of the, uh, uh, from these um, eye recording cameras directly and put them into the model. So here, uh, again, the, the results I've just shown you for the uncontrolled retinal input uh, epochs and only for uh, the neural variants explained by the phase movements. And now we included um, these regressors uh, from the eye tracker, and the re regressors include the horizontal and vertical eye position, eye speed, uh, pupil size, and pupil derivative. And including these regressors uh, reduced the unique variants uh, due to phase movements substantially during these uncontrolled retinal epochs. And this pattern was also consistent across all the recorded um, epochs. So including these eye regressors explained away the variance due to these uh, spontaneous movements. What this tells us is that here's the lateral view of a macaque brain. Um, so what this tells us is that in the macaque, it's not the movement themselves that drive effect uh, in uh, these visual areas, but it's the effect of movements on the retinal input that uh, drive this activity in a feed-forward way. This brings me now, uh, so to summarize this first question, at least for the early uh, to mid-level visual areas, V1, V2, V3, V3, A, movements largely do not contribute uh, to, or do not modulate neural activity. Now this brings me to the second question, do, uh, are these uh, modulations by uh, movement or attention linked? To address this, we used a model-free approach and simply split the trials or the, uh, the data into epochs with high and with low uh, spontaneous body movements. And then we also split the data into whether the attention was paid towards the receptor field or outside of the receptor field. So here are just the average PSDHs. Um, and uh, so in, uh, for the high uh, movement epochs, and uh, the dark blue is when the attention was paid towards the receptive field, and in light blue uh, when the uh, attention was outside of the receptive field. And now superimposed uh, are the uh, PSDHs when uh, the monkeys were were not moving or hardly uh, moving at all. And it's hard actually, if I hadn't uh, uh, built this up, I think you would hardly see that these are uh, two different uh, curves. So it's almost identical. While um, there is this very characteristic uh, modulation by spatial attention, this higher firing rate. Now, we then also computed uh, an index that was the ratio of the sum, um, of the difference um, of the responses divided by their sum. And this in the index is shown here, um, on the x-axis for attention, on the y-axis uh, for movements. And uh, you can see that uh, these um, 
uh, modulations are not associated with each other, so there's no correlation in any of these areas. And moreover, it actually gives you a direct comparison of the size of these uh, effects. So for movement, there's really, really very little going on. And even if we compare it to the already rather small modulation by attention influence of the primary visual cortex, this uh, modulation or any modulation that we see there by these movements is still uh, substantially smaller. So, um, to summarize the second point, or to answer the second question, it's a clear no, uh, at least for these uh, uh, visual areas, V1, V2, V3, VA, that these uh, two types of modulations are not associated with each other. So this brings me to the overall summary. Um, for early to mid-level visual areas, in the macaques, uh, movements largely do not uh, modulate activity. And of course, if one would expect at least some degree of modulation in areas, in higher areas, uh, that are considered to be, for instance, more sensory motor. And indeed, uh, modulation by task unrelated spontaneous movements has been observed recently in prefrontal cortex, but uh, even there, uh, the, the degree of these modulation was smaller than those that had previously been observed in mice. Moreover, um, <clears throat> there has been a, pre, uh, a comparative study uh, comparing r the modulation by running, by locomotion, uh, or running on a treadmill between um, in marmosets versus mice. And what was found there is that in comparison to the very sizable modulation, uh, sizable increase in firing rates observed in mice, the modulation uh, uh, was very small in marmosets and it was slightly uh, suppressive. So this really suggests that um, there uh, seems to be a species difference. And I think this uh, likely uh, reflects the degree to which these areas are really um, modulated by, uh, by uh, behavioral state. And um, I think that what this also shows is the importance of having really fairly direct parallel studies, even for very simple behaviors. And I think tomorrow we'll hear from the Zero Noise Lab some really ele elegant example of such a direct uh, interspecies uh, comparison. And with this, I'd like to um, again uh, acknowledge my group and the funding sources, and also <laughs> end with an um, advertisement for an open postdoc position. Uh, please come to me, uh, talk to me if you're uh, uh, to talk about possible uh, projects in the lab. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.